Language is a human universal, despite the fact that there are many different individual languages. Music also exists in every known human culture, although the details of style can vary greatly. To me, this means that, as with language, music must depend on some universal aspects of the human mind. While I'm not a neurologist, nor a professional psychology researcher, it's hard not to see some fundamental psychological facts behind the way we react to music, even while accepting the existence of substantial cultural differences. One basic aspect of the brain is our constant search for patterns. Seeing patterns is an obvious aid to survival. If I recognize a lion when I see one, then I have a better chance of not being eaten. We may of course be wrong about patterns, or even see patterns where there are none. However, given the fact that I see music as patterns in sound, organized to encourage certain kinds of responses, I've never been interested in music that purposely avoids all perceptible patterns. While it's true that occasionally chance can lead to something of interest, chance in itself is no guarantee of a musically appealing result. An excellent book by David Yoran, Sweet Anticipation, talks about musical patterns and the expectations they create as a source of much of music's effect on us. As a composer, my main job is creating patterns in sound. The kinds of patterns will vary greatly depending on the composer's goal and the overall context. Background music for an elevator won't aim at the kinds of novelty and contrast that we expect from, say, film music or concert music. Anyway, once we have any kind of pattern, we also have expectations. Take the following example. The pattern here is obvious, just three notes repeated indefinitely. But with no variety at all, it quickly gets boring. There's no suspense here. Okay, how about this? Well, this isn't boring, at least not at first, but much as we try to find a clear pattern, apart from the obvious fact that it's all played on the piano, there's not much rhyme or reason to it. Imagine this continuing indefinitely, soon we'd lose interest. Conclusion, randomness by itself does not hold our interest very well. Okay, let's try again. This is better, since we quickly notice the rising sequence. This is an example of a simple pattern combining repetition with what I call progression. Note that I'm not using the term progression in the common sense of harmonic progressions, but rather to refer to any dimension of music that's clearly increasing or decreasing. Progressions are a special kind of pattern where some dimension of the music incrementally changes during a stretch of time. In this case, the gradual rising line creates the progression. Other examples could include an orchestral crescendo or a decrescendo, harmony getting more or less dissonant, and so on. Progressions are very useful to composers since they create more tension and suspense than simple repetition. But even here, the progression itself gets monotonous before long. So let's make it just a bit less predictable. This is definitely an improvement. As before, we noticed a gradually rising line, but here the details aren't 100% predictable. At the same time, they're not so random as to make us lose all hope of making sense of the overall result. Note that I'm not talking about criteria for great music here, just for music that holds my attention sufficiently for me to want to continue. From the composer's point of view, finding the balance between patterns that do what we expect and patterns that surprise us is perhaps the most common problem in creating music. Too much predictability and we stop paying attention, too little and we just hear chaos and lose interest. Surprise comes from novelty or contrast. This leads us to a simple but essential tool for composers, the idea of degrees of contrast. Between total predictability and total chaos, there's a continuum of degrees of novelty. Not all contrasts are equal, and we usually wouldn't want them to be equal. Within a piece of any length, we need variety in the amount of contrast at different points along the way. Often, problems in musical form are really issues of too much or not enough contrast. Understanding this makes it much easier to solve them. Simply asking yourself, is there too much novelty or too little at this point, 
is a very powerful question for improving your work. In our next lesson, we'll look at other psychological principles providing very useful tools for composers.